What an absolutely gorgeous day. Uh, we actually had to turn the air conditioning on for Easter Sunday. Can you believe that? Yeah. So for those of you who don't believe in miracles, right there, you got to... No, we're so glad that you're here today. Uh, Jesus had a way of turning things around. In a culture where there was really not much medical help available, and sometimes they could even do more harm than good, he made many sick people well. And in a culture where poverty imposed a kind of stress at every level of life, he was able to bring peace. And in a culture where bondage could be as crude as human slavery or as intricate and still uh, as dangerous as internal slavery, he was able to bring freedom. Every single situation that came before him, he seemed to have an answer for. He could calm storms and heal diseases. The poor, when they were around him, they felt significant. And when he talked, God seemed very real and very close. People around him finally had a reason to hope. And then the unthinkable happened. Jesus was arrested. He was tried. He was found guilty. And he was executed. And people could remember what their lives were like before Jesus. And they were terrified it was going to be like that again. Grief mixed with fear and hopelessness drove them to a kind of terror it's hard to describe. And that's where we enter the story this morning in Luke's Gospel, the 20th chapter. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon P Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. The original language there actually means do not hold on so tightly to me, for I have not yet ascended. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Resurrection is uh, not an easy thing to believe for any generation. In case you think that uh, people in the first century readily accepted some things, it's simply not true. The claim of resurrecting from the dead seems impossible, and it's always been uncomfortable for lots of people to believe, and that's why they come up with kind of alternative explanations. Maybe Jesus didn't really die. Uh, maybe he just appeared to be dead and recovered. There are even some who suspect that he's been given some kind of medication that made him appear dead and then he recovered afterwards. But of course the problem is it was Roman soldiers who were doing the execution and if there was one thing Roman soldiers were really good at, it was killing people. 
And no disciple of Jesus would have been fooled by some half-drugged, beat-up person who claimed to be coming back from the dead. As other people say, well, maybe it was a case of mistaken identity. I mean, it's early before the light is fully up, before dawn, and people in their grief-stricken state might misidentify um, who they're standing in front of or talking to. But of course, the sun didn't stay dark for long, and they would have noticed and Mary was not the only witness. There are some who say, well, Jesus only appeared to the people who actually believed in him, so that makes their testimony a little bit suspect, except that the biblical record actually tells us that he appeared to people who didn't believe in him. Thomas, even though he had been a follower, was convinced that Jesus was dead and not going to come back, and when he was told of the resurrection, he didn't believe those who told him, and he said he needed to see physical, tangible proof before he would believe. There's also another individual who is not a believer, and that was Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. He wasn't just not a believer, he was a persecutor of people who claimed to uh, say that Jesus raised from the dead. He would go and arrest them and threaten to murder them. And then there are some who say, well, it was really more of a spiritual resurrection. Uh, you know, just uh, resurrected in spirit, his body's there, but you know what? This is not a nicer description of death. It's a defeat of death. At the end of the day, people were confronted with two main issues, and the first is an empty tomb. If the body had been removed, then all somebody would have to do is show the body, and that would have ended this whole thing called Christianity. And if you say, well, the disciples may have moved it, then the question is, why would they die for something they knew was a lie? People will die for something they believe is true. People won't die for a lie. And of course, there were eyewitnesses, and not just one or two, but hundreds. And back in that day, that didn't make you popular. That got you persecuted. There were people who gave their life because they had to acknowledge that Jesus rose from the dead. And what gave them such bravery and courage in acknowledging it was they realized for themselves that death could not be the final end. Witnesses were not popular. They were persecuted. And then there's this little thing left in the scripture. It's really interesting that it's there at all, but there are these linen strips and the head covering left behind. If you're going to steal a body, why would you leave those things? Oh, one more thing that is a really important thing, and it doesn't, we don't notice it because our culture is quite differently from the first culture, but it says that the first witness of the resurrection was a woman. Now, that might not seem like such a big deal to you, but in fact, in the early days when people tried to attack Christianity and argue that it was not legitimate, one of the things that they would point to is that the first witnesses of the resurrection were women, and we know women can't be believed because of how hysterical they are. That's what they said in the first century. And of course, women didn't have much standing or status in that culture. So if you were fabricating a story about the resurrection, the last thing you would ever do is say that the first witness was a woman because it made it harder to believe. The only reason Scripture says that the first witness was a woman was because the first witness was a woman. As it turns out, the resurrection of Jesus interrupts everything. That interruption of death, that interruption of despair, that interruption with grace, it interrupts everything. It's not just a funeral service being interrupted that day. It's something far more. Now, hidden in John's account of this resurrection is something I've never really thought much about until I was preparing for this week. And that is that when Jesus stands behind Mary and she doesn't realize who he is, and she's saying, where have they laid him? And have you taken him somewhere? And, and if I were Jesus, I would have gone... Ta-da! Is that what you would do? Or maybe just say, it's me, it's Jesus. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't use his name, he uses her name. Why, was he, why would he do that? And as I thought about this, it occurred to me that when someone uses your name, there's always meaning attached to it. Like when I was growing up, if one of my parents said, Robert Dennis, there was meaning attached to that. And it was not a good meaning. Or maybe you can remember when you had some romantic interest in your life, and when they would say your name, you felt like you were flying. Or maybe you had a teacher who managed to catch you every time you were acting out of bounds or not prepared for the class. 
I had a teacher one time who told us at the beginning of the school year, I will assign hom homework in every class. And I will check homework in every class, but I will only check two people's homework. And I will select them randomly. I have two dice. The red will be for the row, and the green will be for the seat. And I will roll the dice, and if you are the person, then you have to show your homework. If you didn't do your homework and you are not called on, no one will know. I don't remember a single time anybody ever was able to give him their homework. He had, they were like magic dice. He could always find, if there were two people who didn't do their homework, he could find them. It was straight, and he would say your name, and he would put a big check mark, and you knew what it meant. You see, when you hear your name, you can be reminded of things. For example, when you hear your name, you can be reminded of what you're pretending to be. Sometimes people say your name, and you have to go into acting mode, because we have to manage our image. It's not just a matter of putting our best foot forward. That's a good thing. We actually pretend to be someone that we're not. We try to hide our flaws and our failures. And we, we, we've even seen examples of people who've turned in resumes that had all kinds of falsified information on it. Why would they do that? Well, just to get a better opportunity. There's been military generals who had awards and medals on their jackets that they hadn't earned. And when it was discovered, they were disgraced. Why would they put it there when they hadn't earned it? Because they want to be accepted rather than rejected. They want someone to think more of them than they actually are. When do we start this kind of pretending? Well, at a terrifyingly young age. When Rachel was so little, she couldn't walk in or speak in sentences. Monosyllabic syllables, that's all we got from her. I was holding her on my lap on the end of a couch, and, and, and I, there was a little washcloth on the arm of the couch, and so it was just sitting there, and she went to grab it, and I just snatched it away before her chubby little hand could grab it. And she just kind of looked at me, and I smiled, and I put it back. And so she looked at me, and she looked at that, and she went to grab it, and because dads are faster than babies, snatched it away again. And she just looked at me, kind of tilted her head a little bit. I put it back. She looked up at me. She smiled. She raised her arms for a hug. And when I went to hug her, she snatched the washcloth. <laughs> she was pretending to hug me. She knew exactly what she was doing. She wasn't even talking yet. And I realized I am in big trouble because I'm being outsmarted by a baby that's not even talking yet. We can pretend that we are fine when we are actually hurt. We can pretend that we are in control when we're actually addicted. We can pretend that we're busy when we're not. We can pretend to know things that we don't know. And here's the challenge, is the more you pretend, the less sure you become of who you really are. Pretending is hard work, and it will make you tired, and eventually the real you dies. Sometimes when we hear our name, we're reminded of what we think we should be. There's no shortage of expectations in our worlds or in our lives, and when we don't meet those expectations, we usually get some guilt that goes along with it. You should be a better dad or a better mom. You should be a smarter. You should be healthier. You should be a better friend. You should be a better spouse. And we strive. We work so hard. And we compare ourselves with other people who seem to be doing better at it, and so we try to be like them. And here's the thing. The harder we try the less of us there is to live the life that God called us to. Sometimes when we hear our name, what we hear is what others expect us to be. Lots of expectations in our world. Your boss expects you to be more productive. Your trainer expects you to be more fit. Your credit card company expects you to be more in debt. Everyone has an agenda for your life. And here's the thing. The reason we try to live up to it is because we want them to love us. But the question is, do they really love us or just the reflection of the expectation that they've imposed on us? If we disappoint them, what happens? And the truth is, we can't live out the expectation of other people for our lives. It's not what we've been created to do. It's not what Jesus asks us to do. And when we try, something dies. So the, the last one I want to talk about is sometimes when uh, we hear our name, we, we're afraid of what God wants us to be. 
Some people are worried that if they say yes to God in any way, he's going to bury them with rules. He's going to smother them with, uh, smother their desires. He's going to control their emotions. And worse than all of that is he's going to make them this kind of person that looks down their nose at everybody else that doesn't measure up. And here's the thing. If you think God is like that, you will never trust him and you'll never ask him to lead your life. So that's why it's so important that we learn to deal with these things, because every single one of us have an internal side of us. I can look at you and, and notice things on the external side of you, but on the internal part, there's this spiritual, emotional, soul part of us, and it's moving in one direction or another. It's either getting healthier or it's getting weaker. And when we live with all of this, trying to live up to other expectations and living in constant fear and worried about being rejected and pretending, when we live like that, the internal part of us starts to die. And for lots of people in this room, that's not new news. You already know it. You might say, well, I'm not emotionally ill. That's not the question. The question is, are, are you emotionally vibrant? Do you feel like life is really worth the living? And that's why Jesus speaks Mary's name. I think that when Jesus speaks your name, you are reminded of who you were created to be. We know some interesting things about Mary, and uh, she's gotten a lot of bad press over the years. There have been some things that never should have been said about her. It's not written in Scripture, but we do know that she was possessed of seven spirits, and Jesus set her free. Can you imagine how afraid she was that those things could return once Jesus was gone? Because when Jesus set her free, she could see a completely different kind of life, and she was learning to live it, and she was enjoying it. And now he speaks her name, and all of that hope is returned. In that single moment, I believe there was another resurrection that occurred right there next to that tomb. Jesus had already been raised from the dead, but now her hope in her future is being resurrected again. So the question is, how does this happen? See, the simple truth is that people wanted to define Jesus as some kind of a revolutionary lunatic, an individual who just had some small band of followers that, that believed him in some kind of a crazy way, and once he was gone, there was going to be nothing left of him. And so they threw everything they had at Jesus. They beat him, they, they shamed him, they destroyed his physical body, and they buried him in the ground. And that's what they said, now you will be forever defined as this. But the challenge for them was is that Jesus was not defined by whips or by spears or by nails or by uh, pieces of wood that were nailed together. Jesus was not defined even by the tomb that he was put in. Jesus was defined by the fact that even that place could not contain him or restrain him, and he is victorious over it. Jesus is not defined by his death. He's defined by his resurrection. That's what makes him king of kings and lord of lords. That's how he's defined. And he's the one who's calling your name. So how do we experience this? Because I think that's a valid question. And here's the thing. There are lots of people who think the whole heaven thing, the whole God thing, is some, about some minimum requirements we have to meet. And if you ask people, they'll say things like, well, I think in my life I've done more good than bad. So like it's a weight balance thing. As long as there's more good than bad, I'm okay. Then you get some people, this is what they'll say. Well, I haven't killed anybody. How many want heaven to be populated with the lowest common denominator of at least they didn't kill anybody? That, that's not what it's about. As it turns out, the entrance requirements for heaven are not the good get in and the bad are kept out, or the healthy get in and the sick are kept out, or the smart get in and the ignorant are kept out. In the kingdom of heaven, it is the humble that get in and the proud that are kept out. All you have to be willing to do is admit you're not perfect. That's all you have to be willing to do. And none of us are. Let's just take a check this morning, all right? How many here are willing to acknowledge you're not perfect? Okay? That's the first step. That's the first step. And one of the most important you can make, because this is what's true. It is very easy for us to look at other people and compare to them, and I'm at least better than them. At least I tell the truth. Maybe you do. Well, at least I'm not a murderer. Maybe you're not. Well, at least I'm not a child molester. I'm glad to hear that. 
Maybe you're not a, 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 a live in some kind of addiction or perversion. That's wonderful. I, I'm glad for all of those things. The problem is, is that when you get to heaven, we're not being compared to the people who are worse than you. We're being compared to God. That's the challenge. And so what we have to do is not only admit that there is this imperfection in us, the second thing is to trust that Christ has made up the difference between where we are and where God is. That what he accomplished on the cross was to close that distance. That I might be better than some people, but I'm not as good as God. And so I need help to get where he is. And that's what Jesus has come to do. So then we can do this. We can also ask him to be the leader of our lives. This is what Mary does. It's a fascinating thing. When she sees him, she grabs him, and she hangs on to him for dear... Yes. Because she knows that's the source of her life. And she says, teacher, that's what she calls him, because she knows in order to live this life, Someone has to help me. When I try to do this on my own, it doesn't work. But Jesus knows how. And here's the thing. There are people in rooms like this that get very anxious when I talk about things like this. Because this is what they think. They think you're making it too easy, Pastor. There are going to be people who think that, that they've got the grace of God and they're going to heaven and they will live any way they want. And that's not how it's supposed to work. And I just want to tell you, that's not what grace is. But it is not earning your way into heaven. If you think you're going to earn your way into heaven, then you should know that's what every religion on the face of the planet works towards. They've all got their own paths. But at the end of the day... They're never sure. The reason that we ask Jesus to teach us, the reason that we allow him to change our lives is not because we're trying to earn it, but because we're grateful for it. So let's suppose this morning that uh, service is dismissed. You're on your way out the door. All of a sudden, you fall to the ground completely unconscious. People around you call 911. An ambulance takes you to the hospital, and they discover that you have a very rare situation in your heart, which there's very few people in the United States of America who are capable of doing the procedure. And if, unless you have it within minutes, you're going to die. As it turns out, one of those surgeons happens to be in the hospital you are at. They immediately page him, they call him, he comes into the room, he performs this procedure, and your life is spared. Not exactly how you planned your day, but it would be a good day. And let's suppose a couple of days later, later, you're feeling pretty good, and so you're getting ready to be dismissed from the hospital, and as you're walking through the lobby of the hospital, there is the doctor that saved your life. And you go up to the doctor and you shake his hand. You might even give, the, might even give her a hug and just say, oh, thank you so much for saving my life. And, and, and she would look at you and she would say, it's what I've devoted my life for. It's the reason that I studied. It's the reason that I work the hours that I do. Because I want to see people healthy and whole. I don't want to see families torn apart by death. And you would just look at her and, and you would say, I am so grateful. Thank you. And then she would look at you and she would say, I'm actually supposed to be at the airport right now. And the person that, that, that was supposed to give me a drive over, they're not here. Could you take me to the airport? And you would say, I'm a little busy. Um, I really got put behind this couple days being in the hospital and all of this and, you know, paperwork and, and phone calls, emails, all of that. You know, I, I really appreciate what you did, but is that what any of us would do? We would say, oh, excuse my car, but yes, of course, I'm happy to take you. Do you see the difference? You wouldn't be earning the surgery. You wouldn't be earning the life that was restored to you. You'd be demonstrating gratitude for it. And that's what grace does. God doesn't say, when you get here, I'll finally give it to you. God says, here it is. And by the way, he's going to ask you some things. He will. He'll ask you to show generosity with things you would rather hang on to. And he will ask you to hang around people you would rather avoid. And he will ask you to deal with things that you would rather hide. 
And every time we exercise that generosity and every time we get close to someone we'd rather stay away from and every time we deal with those issues, it's not to earn the grace of God. It's just that we're so grateful that he did this for us. We're saying like Mary did, teacher, and we're letting him teach us how to walk through this life in the kind of life that he designed for us and he hoped and planned for us. And only he can give it to us. That's what he calls, to, calls us to. Let's bow our heads this morning. There's this great passage in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. And this is what the Lord says. I am the Lord. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. And you are mine. He is in this room today. You might not have recognized him. And he is calling you by name. He's not asking you to pretend anything. He's not trying to set up some expectation that you can't live up to. He's not doing any of those things. But he is telling you that you don't have to settle for life as you're currently experiencing it. There's something that he has planned for you that's greater and deeper and richer. He has come that you might have life and a full life at that. So the question is, will you answer his call to your name? Will you ask him to be your teacher? So I'm going to actually start. I'm going to ask everybody's head is bowed and everybody's eyes closed. And I'm going to look over at the wall where the doors are and the lobby side is. And if you are making that decision today to answer the call of Jesus calling your name, that you're going to admit, I'm not a perfect person. And you're going to trust what you did on the cross closes the distance between me. I don't have to pay for it because you did. And I want you to teach me how to live this life. If you're willing to make that decision today, I'm going to ask you to look right at me. I'm going to start over with this wall over here and when just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. And then and then just a moment, we're going to have prayer together. But over here by this wall, anyone who's making that decision today, just look right at me. I see that person. I see that person. I see that person. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. I'm in the next section over. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking look right at me. I see that person, that person, that person, that person. Thank you. That person, that person. Thank you. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. That person, that person. Thank you. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. I'm in the section right in front of me now. Just keep looking. I see that person. I see that person and that person. Just keep looking. I see that person and that person and that person. That person. That person. Just keep looking. That person, that person, that person. Just keep looking. Keep looking. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. That person. Next section over. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. That person. Thank you. That person. Thank you. Just keep looking. That person. Thank you. That person. Keep looking. That person. Thank you. Just keep looking. That person. Thank you that person. Thank you. Last section over. Just look right at me. I see that person. That person. That person. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't claim that we are good enough, that we've earned grace. Quite the opposite. We acknowledge that we fall short as hard as we try, as much effort as we give it, we always seem to fall short. Would you help us know today that you have come to grant us an incredible gift, that you are calling us by name, and in so doing, you are reminding us that you have a wonderful life that you want us to live, that we don't have to strive to build a life that someone else desires for us, or even that we have tried to build for ourselves, but that we can trust you and I ask that every single one of those individuals who lifted their eyes today, 
that they will have the courage to look to you to be their teacher, not just to receive the incredible gift, but to also show how to live out the kind of life that makes life worth living. Today, we hold on to you for dear life, and we call you our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we welcome all those folks into the family of faith this morning? Amen. Amen. And would you stand with me this morning?